Now, there's one other point here, uh, and that's about sun exposure. So I am absolutely not saying that sunlight is not healthy. What I'm saying is that some sunlight is not healthy. So generally, there's three types of UV radiation, and only two of them will penetrate the atmosphere, except on areas where we've got ozone depletion. We don't need to talk about that. But that's UVA and UVB. They're different wavelengths. UVA is quite a long wavelength, and that means it penetrates the atmosphere very nicely. UVB is a little bit shorter, so it doesn't penetrate the atmosphere quite as well. So if we imagine that we've got... The, uh, the surface of the Earth, and then you've got a layer of atmosphere on top of the Earth. So, well, this is the conference that I'm at, by the way. Um, if the sun's directly overhead, you can see the thickness of atmosphere that it's going to be going through is quite small. So UVB, which actually gets effectively attenuated as it passes through the atmosphere, this is going to be the optimal direction that UVB can get down to cause sunburn. Whereas if the sun's low in the sky and it's coming in on an angle, you can see it could be going through a much longer thickness of atmosphere relatively, and that will actually attenuate out the UVB rays. Now, the UVA is less affected because of the longer wavelength, so that will still get through. So what this means is that when the sun's lower in the sky, you get UVA radiation without getting and much less UVB radiation. In the middle of the day when the sun's overhead, but that's when you produce vitamin D, um, that's when you get sunburned. Now, the key factor is that ultraviolet A radiation produces a very important factor for health. Mm -hmm. It stimulates something called nitric oxide synthase, which I think in 2006 or thereabouts, made probably a different year, it got molecule of the year. Um, pretty important molecule. And that has been associated with improved blood sugar control, improved blood pressure, and basically a bunch of good effects. And in actual fact, this is likely to be a very good reason um, for sun exposure actually being associated with longevity. Not only sun exposure, so here's a crazy study. There's actually studies that demonstrate that sun-induced skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma, in a population study in Denmark was associated with an increase in lifespan of about 10 years. Similar to the you know the benefit in terms of people who have been lifelong smokers in reverse. So people with skin cancer on average lived longer. This is not to say the skin cancer was good. This was to say there was something else about the lifestyle of these people that may have been good. And I think the most likely explanation for that is the fact that if they, uh, they were exposing themselves to the sun, not only sure they were getting skin cancers, which indicates they were probably getting UVB damage, but they were also getting UVA. And I think there's some inherently good properties from ultraviolet A, given that it, it assists with the synthesis of nitric oxide. So my uh, you know, vitamin D rant is not to say that you shouldn't expose yourself to the sun. It's say that you should expose yourself to the sun in a way that you won't get sunburned. Now, in New Zealand, they've got a really nice way of doing this. They just look at the length of your shadow. And as a surrogate marker, if the length of your shadow is shorter than you, then that is suggesting the sun's getting pretty overhead. And the view UV index is, uh, the UVB index is probably going to be, uh, you know, getting up there and you're more likely to burn. And that's a really nice rule of thumb. In Australia, we try and have a rule, say, expose yourself between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Well, that's a nonsense rule because what happens if you live in Hobart or if you live in Brisbane? There are different latitudes. What about summer and what about winter? Different seasons. So different. the latitude and season will actually impact the height of the sun in the sky at different points of time during the day. So it makes far more sense to have an absolute rule that actually more closely reflects the mass of atmosphere that the sun rays are passing through and the length of your shadow, uh, I think, is a, a good marker for that. So I think that's enough on that soapbox for the moment. <laughs> that's well, you know, but even to actually add to your point um, uh, about vitamin D just you know, being uh, protective as a, as a sunblock, I remember reading an article years ago 
talking about how uh, vitamin D is actually synthesized on the surface of your skin. And therefore, if you want to absorb it, you actually have to uh, let it soak in. It took about six hours to soak in. And so if you went out to the beach, you went out in the sun, you'd have all this vitamin D on your skin, but then people would take a shower to get the sweat off them and they'd wash <laughs> off all the vitamin D. And so this was saying that you really need to let it soak in. So when you're out at sun exposure, you need to wait for at least six hours to, to absorb all the vitamin D. So that actually fits right in line with your- And they, they sort of missed a trick there. So obviously if it's being produced on, you know, within the mm. skin like that, it's, it's actually, it, why would it, why would yeah. the body produce it there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, on the surface of the skin. And, and, it's and a sunscreen, it's hour, vitamin D is hour. a sunscreen. Yeah. What, what is that? Um, I was interested when you said that um, it was it was produced as a, um, a sunscreen for like 500 million years. How, where, where did we see that? How do we? How do Phytoplankton. We that? Yeah. So within the fossil record. Okay. Right. And so how did they figure out that it was used as a, as a sunscreen? I believe, well, I think it's, I'm not exactly sure of the mechanisms, but they mm. did relate it back to DNA damage and without vitamin D okay. production, apparently their DNA was destroyed. Um, so they couldn't survive. So I, I presume they've probably, um, going back to the fossil record, they've found equivalent phytoplankton today that look identical to that. Mm -hmm. And they've probably done experiments where they've impaired their vitamin D synthesis and seen that they get fried up in the sun. I didn't delve down into the, the molecular genetic, yeah. uh, you know, genetics of what they did, but I imagine that's the only reasonable way you could draw that conclusion. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's super interesting anyway. And it's um, you know, something that I've had to reconsider now too, since, since seeing your, uh, your, your soapbox box rant at the, at, the at the conference, that made me sort of think about like, hmm, all right, you know, maybe we should think about this. Um, well, that's cool. It's really interesting.